I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. I call to worship is in your bulletin. If you could stand, if you're able, and join me in that. Come to worship Jesus Christ, Alpha and Omega, the one who is, who was, and is to come. Come to worship Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Good shepherd, true vine. Wonderful counselor, prince of peace. We come to worship Jesus Christ, king of kings and lord of lords. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our opening song is found in the insert in your bulletin, Awesome God. Would you join me in singing? Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with witness. Some power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Thank you. You may be seated. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, you who we pretend to know so well in our creeds, in our prayers, in our masquerades, today we want to see Jesus. Today we want to experience the Holy Spirit's presence. Today we come to worship you. Help us to be real. Help us to be ready. Help us to be honest because we need you. We need you here with us in this place. We need you in our hearts to be priests, hearing our confession. We need you in our minds to be king of our thoughts. We need you in our lives to be that prophetic voice and in action. This we ask in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our first reading today comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 4b through 8. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priest, serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, 
and those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. And today we look to our John for our gospel reading. John 18, verses 33 through 37. And it reads so. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our sermon today, you may be kind of wondering about where it's all coming from as you hear these two texts that don't seem to really connect one with the other. You hear the texts that lead up to the crucifixion, crucifixion, something that you usually hear only at Easter. But as we go through it and you think about it, you realize that the gospel is talking about Jesus as king. And the reading in Revelation tells us that he is the king and that he's gone, but that he's coming back again. So we have the before birth king and the after death king. So today we're going to talk about being a witness for truth. Whenever I find myself listening to these readings um, about Jesus' trial before his crucifixion, I'm reminded of the time that I spent practicing law. Lawyers are trained to ask yes or no questions of witnesses who are hostile to them. By that I mean those who are not necessarily believing or thinking as what it is you're trying to prove. And it's a way of controlling the information that a witness is able to present to the judge or the jury. You want to get a definitive answer to elicit the truth. This is a power move on the behalf of the one doing the questioning. It's intended to achieve the result that you want for your client. And here we are today with Pilate asking Jesus about who he is. And from the way that the interrogation is presented in our text today, Pilate asked a question that he hoped would elicit a yes or a no answer. Are you a king? Seems simple enough when you hear that. But Jesus chooses not to answer this question. But instead, he asks Pilate, why are you even asking me this? Is it what you think, or is this what somebody told you about me? Is it something that you've heard that caused you to ask me this question? So what does Pilate do? He backs off on his accusation, and he places the blame on the shoulders of the Jewish leaders. Pilate inquires as to what it is that Jesus has done to upset them so. He asked them, what have you done? Now Jesus didn't answer that question. But I think that we have heard enough before about what it is that Jesus has done to be able to answer that question. You see, Jesus has healed the sick. He's been with those who 
were considered sinners. He sat at the table with them. He's met with tax collectors. He's forgiven sins. He's healed on the Sabbath things that people say should not be done. You see, Jesus has turned over the tables in the temple. So when Pilate asked him, Jesus, what have you done to upset them? His list could have been quite long as he answered that question. But Jesus chose not to respond. But I'll ask you, what has Jesus done for you? How have you seen him move in your life? Jesus' reply goes way beyond what Pilate had hoped to discover or get as an answer to that question. See, he was still looking for the truth. But see, the truth is complicated, and it usually is it's not usually really a simple matter. There's always something more to the story. Jesus doesn't answer Pilate's questions, for this isn't about what Jesus has done. It's about who he is. So in reply, Jesus declares that his kingdom is not of this world. You see, kings are political. And Jesus is establishing that his kingship and his kingdom have no connection to politics. In those days, to claim to be a king was dangerous. In fact, it still is in some places. But Jesus' kingship is not based on a geographical location. In fact, it isn't even limited to a particular group of people, like just the Jews, or it's open to all. See, Jesus goes on and he offers that if his kingdom was of this world, his followers, they would behave in the same way that the followers of other kings. And how do the followers of other kings behave when their king is being challenged? They don't sit silently by and allow their king to be put on trial. They resort to violence. They engage in violent means to keep their king from being turned over, keep their king from being overthrown. You see, if his followers were like the followers of other kings whose kingdom is of this world, they would have kept him from being turned over to Pilate. Jesus' kingdom is where God's will rules, and it isn't achieved by acts of violence. Jesus' proclamation regarding his kingdom does little to enlighten Pilate. Pilate continues to be confused. He still doesn't get it. It's still not really making sense to him. What do you mean your kingdom is not of this world? See, he has limited understanding. See, he's only speaking in the physical. He doesn't understand the spiritual. For him, if you have a kingdom, it must be established in some particular location. And you've got to have some specific group who's following you. But see, that's what happens when you enter a situation, assuming that you know the truth. You continue to look for that answer, the answer that you think is there. So Pilate makes what seems to be a declaration this time. It's like, well, if you want to answer my question, maybe if I just simply put it to him, he'll respond in kind. So he said, so you are a king. But this time, Jesus turns the table and is even more direct in his answer to Pilate. And he tells him, that is what you say. <laughs> I didn't say that you did. That is what you say. Jesus then attempts to simplify it for Pilate. Jesus tells Pilate that this isn't some idea that he just thought of. This is the reason for his existence, his whole reason for being. This is why he was there, and that's what he was doing when he was sent here to do. See, every action he had taken, every move he had made was what he was sent here to do. Every time he healed the sick, that's why he was sent. When he was 12 years old and his parents had gone off and left him and they went back and found him in the temple and they asked him, what are you doing here? Why didn't you come with us? Why you had us so scared and worried? He said, don't you know I'm here to be about my father's business? Where else would I be but in my father's house? 
His whole life has been about doing what he was sent here to do. He came to share the truth. He came to speak truth to power. Luke 4 tells us what Jesus' purpose was. It says the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jesus because he had anointed Jesus to bring the good news to the poor. God has sent Jesus to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He sent him to let the oppressed go free. What king or any political leader do you know was sent to bring good news to the poor? Proclaim release to the captives and re recovery of sight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free? Clearly his kingdom was not of this world. You see, Jesus came to the least of these. He came to those on the margins. He came to those who are sick in body, mind, and in spirit. He came to the broken and the hopeless. Jesus tells Pilate that he knows that Pilate doesn't understand. But he goes on to say that those who belong to the truth, those who are the property of the truth, those who are a part of the truth, who are a member of the truth, they listen to Jesus' voice, his disciples, his followers. They listen to his voice. He tells us earlier in John that his sheep know his voice. You see, to belong to the truth is to recognize in Jesus the truth of God, to see the fullness of God revealed in Jesus, to hear the words of God in Jesus' voice. Whose voice are you listening to? You see, we give power to the voice that we listen to. We allow them, those who speak, whose voices we listen to, to determine our own truth. You see, our world is filled with voices. Voices of friends, voices of families, voices of political leaders, voices of the doctors, voices telling us who we are and who we aren't. There are voices telling us we aren't good enough. Voices telling us we aren't worthy. Voices from the outside and even voices from the inside. Even our own voices condemning us, degrading us, limiting us, isolating us, excluding us. Voices that speak hate and not love. Voices that discriminate and voices that misidentify. Voices that tear down but not build up. Whose voice are you listening to? When we find ourselves in that place of struggle, of challenge, a place of pain and despair, a place of uncertainty and confusion, it is easy to listen to the voice that speaks the loudest. The voice that seems to have all the answers to those questions that we haven't even bothered to ask. You see, some of those voices even speak a portion of the truth. But be not deceived. You see, Jesus came to testify to the truth. He says that he's a witness to the truth. Pilate thought that Jesus was a witness for or against himself, but Jesus was a witness for the truth. You see, truth is the word become flesh. Truth is that God loved the world so much that he sent Jesus so that all might be saved through him. It is through Jesus that we come to know God and God's love. And we too are called to be a witness to the truth. You see, as a lawyer, when a witness is under a certain age, usually the age of 12, the lawyer calls, who calls the witness to testify has to prove that the child knows what the truth is. The questioning usually goes something like this. The lawyer will ask the child, do you know the difference between the truth and a lie? And the child usually says yes. And the lawyer then asks um, older children, well, what is the truth? And what is a lie? But for younger children, they get to lead the question a little bit, and he, the question becomes, Is the truth what really happened? Or is it something that you make up? And hopefully the child will answer correctly and say that the truth is what really happened. 
But see, that's not enough to qualify this child and to prove that he really knows what the truth is. So he has to go on even further with the questioning. So he has to make sure that the child understands what he's saying. So he'll say something like, if I said your shirt was purple, would that be a truth or would that be a lie? Verification of the truth. But see, here we aren't talking about that physical truth. We're talking about a spiritual one. A spiritual truth. The truth that isn't always so easy to ascertain as to ask the question of, is your shirt purple? We're talking about a truth that's difficult to understand if you are not a follower of Jesus. A truth that we haven't always received openly. A truth that sometimes we want to turn back on. A truth that requires something of us. You see, the truth requires us to be a witness to the truth. What do our lives witness to? Well, see, John tells us that we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. God tells us that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, how do we love our neighbor as ourselves if we have not figured out how to love ourselves? If we're listening to the voice not of the king of kings and the Lord of lords, but the voice that says that you don't matter. Are people able to come to know God and God's love through your actions? Do we actually love God and each other? Being witness for the truth is about being in relationship with the king. It's about a king who willingly gave up his life so that we might have eternal life. It's about a king who says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, regardless of what the other voices say. It's about a king who promised to never leave us or forsake us. It's about a king who sent us a comforter so that we'll know that we have not been abandoned in our time of need. We have a king who knows our struggles, a king who has known sorrow and pain and betrayal. We have a king who forgave those who forgave those who even killed him. You see, being a witness for the truth is about a God who is with us in our suffering. Being a witness to the truth means that we have to be willing to speak the truth. And just as Jesus did, sometimes it requires us to speak truth to power. When you become a witness in court, you take the oath. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. What is your truth? What does your life look like? How do we live such that we true are witnesses for truth? Not what we say, but what we do. How we actually live out the truth in our lives. There's a story about an Amish man, and there was an evangelist who was visiting. An Amish man was, uh, went and asked, I'm sorry, the evangelist went and asked this Amish man whether he had been saved, and whether he had ever accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Well, you know, the gentleman replied, why do you ask me such a thing? Kind of makes you think about Jesus a little bit, doesn't it? Why are you asking me this? Did somebody tell you something? But the Amish said, I can tell you anything. But here, here are the names of my banker, my grocery, my farm's hands. Ask them if I've been saved. You see, he's living out the truth in his life. It's not just something that he could answer. And see, he was like Jesus. He knows that to answer the question is not always the full and complete answer. Answering the question doesn't make it the truth. It's the truth as you understand it. But the question becomes, how are you living your life? When people see you, do they see the God in you? Being a witness for the truth is about living a life that bears out that truth. And like the Amish man, what would your boss, the clerks where you shop, 
What would they say that you are a witness to? What do they get by watching you, by seeing you? What kind of witness for the truth are you? Are you the one that when people will ask you that question, not are you a king? But Revelation tells us that we are priests and kings because we were all created in God's image. But somebody who comes and approaches you or somebody comes to want to find out a little something about you and they ask you a question and they already assume they know the answer to the question. Will they get an answer that's complicated? Or will they get just a simple yes or no? Or will they hear you and think like the Amish man did who says, go ask somebody about me. Let them tell you whether I am a witness to the truth. Because see, I can tell you anything. Jesus could have told Pilate exactly what he wanted to hear. He could have said, no, I'm not the king. He could have denied it all. And from the way Pilate was behaving, it appears that Pilate was not interested, at least at this point, in finding Jesus guilty of having done anything. All Jesus needed to have done is to simply say no. But see, what he did was that he took the time to get Pilate to understand that his kingdom is not of this world, that he's different from others. He went on long enough for him to discover that it's about more than that just that. He gave him an understanding of what being a witness to the truth means. Such so that if you continue reading the story that when Jesus is actually hung on the cross, Pilate has a sign placed above his head that says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Be a witness to the truth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I close this song. It's soon and very soon, and it's found in your book. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the king. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the king. No more dying there. We are going to see the king. No more dying there. We are going to see the king. No more dying there. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the king. Amen. I invite you to join me in a moment of silence as we think about the word that we've heard today and to think about how we can all be witnesses to the truth. Sending forth 
as you stand, if you're able. God calls us into the world to embody a realm that is not of this world. Go forth securely, dwelling in hope, victory, confidence, and love as a witness to the truth. Go forth now in the name of the one who is and was and is to come. May God's grace and peace be with you. Amen.